Okay. Uh, Kat, do you want me to go? Sure. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our third session in uh, the CCMA's um, sort of how to relate to your core and how you can best use your core series that we've been putting off for a number of months right now. Uh, today's title is Getting Started with Super Resolution Microscopy. Uh, I'm Desmond Pink. I'm a CSO with Nanostics. That's a spinoff company out of the University of Alberta. And I'm joined by, oh gosh, Catalina, or Katerina, I'm going to muck up your last name. Katerina, nope, I'm not even going to try it. It's Katerina Di Channel Oliveira. Not bad. Uh, ah. And she is a uh, bioimaging facility manager out of uh, the University of Toronto. We're joined today by uh, Paul. Oh my gosh, I'm going to mess up all of your names. Peruti. Perutis. Perutis. There you go. <laughs> Kevin Conway and Thomas Stroll. Uh, and as we uh, get into the discussion, I'll ask them to give a couple of minutes to introduce themselves. I'd also like to mention our sponsor today, BD, who's covering all of our uh, uh, sessions. So a great shout out to BD. I'd also take, like to take this time to actually uh, just let everybody know that there's going to be an email sent out uh, either today or tomorrow. And it's a short survey just to get some feedback on how these sessions are going and if uh, the viewers have any suggestions or uh, any other feedback. So today we're going to we're going to talk about super resolution microscopy and basically we're going to learn about some of the do's and don'ts and some of the practical reality checks. Uh, Katarina was was nice enough to write a, a brief description. Basically, you know there there are so many different types of SRM out there that it's really overwhelming, especially for the novice person who's going to walk into your float or into your core facility and then ask, "I want to do some super resolution. What do I need to know?" Uh, so today we're uh, we're very grateful to have three expert panelists with us, and I think with that, Katarina is going to give us a very short overview. Oh, actually, before we start, yeah. uh, I'm going to ask Sachi Sachiko Sato to give us a brief introduction. She is our uh, Meet the Core. So Ch Sachiko, I'm going to pass it over to you to introduce yourself and give a brief description of your core facility. Okay, so Katarina, would you mind? Uh, yes. Thank you very much today for the giving me opportunity to that, uh, just introduce or briefly talk about uh, our platform and I would like very happy to see your faces finally. So that uh, next slide please. Uh, our fly, uh, our bioimaging platform is relatively modest size of the platform, and I established this platform in 2002 without any choice because we obtain, I obtained uh, the scanning micro, laser scanning microscope that time, and that was one of the first actually the scanning micro confocal microscope in my institution, and uh, many people approached my lab to use it, so I had no choice to start opening a service. Since then, that uh, we have been using. We have been taking uh, the open platform policy where actually we train the students or the research assistant and they are the one doing the operation. And uh, the, I'm not the one actually we really actually land the platform. It was really Christine Lebet. Probably many of you may recognize her face. She was the real person who is running this platform. And uh, we, we are lucky to have uh, five consecutive CFI to obtain the several the equipment. And I'm also very happy to learn today a lot because uh, we got the money to, to buy the super resolution finally. So I'm very looking forward to hear your talks. And uh, for last 10, uh, 20 years, uh, we have trained uh, more than 500 uh, research assistants and students and last year, last five years, roughly the 200. And the current active user is roughly 100 people, and most of them are from uh, our research center or university campus, but also we support uh, several users of the private sectors. And uh, I'm the director, and the uh, co-director would be the Daniel Grass, and also Masai Kosato, who learn more like uh, many software problems. Uh, next slide, please. 
So like I said, there's a modest size. So we have a regular fluorescence microscope and then uh, the electron microscope. But on the top of that, we have a two uh, quorum the spinning disk. And those are the one that uh, who is a driver for the live cell imaging. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the very unique specialty would be that uh, we are specialized for one microscope for the long term live cell imaging. So usually we run like uh, eight different condition and usually one week or so two weeks. And if we have to, we can do the 16 conditions with a two, one month. And many of you know about uh, doing the long term live cell imaging that you have to deal with the cell toxicity and also the system stability. Uh, we noticed that the most of the majority of system instability is coming from actually window based uh, microscopes, uh, sorry, window based PC station. So actually, we developed uh, the software system where actually the old uh, imaging, the image files would be automatically transferred to the Macintosh. So the Macintosh computer would be the one actually processing all the, like, um, for example, extracting the, uh, the, the focal planes, or maybe do the all in focus, the imaging, and then making video, and then do the analysis in by computer, by the Apple computer. In this way, the, the PC system who operate the microscope became very stable. So it, by using this, we are doing uh, quite lots of the long time, the cell imaging. Next slide, price. And uh, one of the things we do is that the left side, the uh, females is really the five FOB, the five, five FOB, so 25 FOB stitch and then uh, autofocus for the DC, the DIC image. Uh, we created the semi-automatic, almost automatic, the cell, automatic cell running uh, sorry, cell tracking system. So we would be able to make a video at the time when finished, the uh, one week's imaging. And also we do the almost automatic that the single cell tracking to fail to produce the cell lineage map. And what is the most important about why we need the cell lineage map is because then most of the single cell technology is always at the end time in the one plan point. And uh, usually they often use the phylogenic uh, cell lineage map to uh, understand about phenomena. But in reality, if you treat the cell, sometimes we notice that the couple of cells died and also cell fusion, also like you see here, like triple division of no car. So empirical single cell tracking and making the empirical cell lineage map would be very important. At the same time, also we using this empirical system that we create, we could do the cell fate simulation in the virtual system. This is our probably the relatively unique expertise we have in here. So, and now we are going to go to the super resolution. So I'm very looking forward to learn from your seminars. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Sachiko. These are amazing videos. Did I hear you correctly? Did I say you were imaging for a whole month? Yes, it's possible. But usually we do one week or so two weeks. But That's if you have to, we could do one month. Wow. Amazing. I might have to call you. Uh, thank you. I, I'm looking forward to <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to do a quick introduction on uh, super resolution microscopy. This is not exhaustive. It's just a little quick overview. So once again, thank you all for joining us today, especially our panelists and our Meet the Cores of Canada guest. Uh, the goal today is to get some very practical tips and advice about getting started with SRM or super resolution microscopy. So what is SRM? I mean, the name sort of gives it away. It's better resolution. We've all seen an image like this before up top. <clears throat> when an infinitely small light source is focused through a high numerical aperture objective, it creates a pattern called the point spread function. And it is this diffraction pattern that determines the limit of resolution in a conventional microscope. So that's about 200 to 300 nanometers laterally and 500 to 800 nanometers axially. So if a sample has the following structure depicted on the bottom left, when you view it through an objective lens, it appears like the image on the right. So SRM encompasses a wide variety of microscope techniques that breaks this limit of resolution and can be broadly categorized into three groups. So the first group uh, is stimulated emission depletion microscopy or STED. This is a deterministic technique invented by Stefan Hell. This relies on the use of a specialized donut shaped laser, which depletes the um, <clears throat> fluorescence in specific regions of the sample 
while leaving the center focal spot here active to emit fluorescence as depicted in the left. The result is an image over here at the bottom that more closely approximates the real structure of our sample. The second category uh, is single molecule localization microscopy. This is a, a stochastic technique deter uh, invented by Betzig and Moriner separately. In this method, only a small proportion of fluorophores are turned on and the centers of their point spread functions are determined and mapped. And then this process is repeated thousands of times until an image is built up. And it relies on the use of photoactivatable or photoswitchable fluorophores. Again, the result is an image that more closely approximates the real structure of our sample. And I like to refer to this last category or this last group as computational SRM, as they all rely on mathematical post-processing methods or <laughs> real-time processing methods. It's worth noting that the first two categories mentioned earlier are sometimes referred to as diffraction unlimited SRM or an anoscopy, while this last category of microscopes are still fundamentally bound by the laws of diffraction. So on the left, there's interference-based structured illumination or conventional SIM microscopy. And in this kind of microscopy, the sample is excited with a known spatially structured pattern and relies on the generation of interference patterns known as the Moiré effect. And different images are acquired and by mathematical deconvolving the interference signal, a super resolution image is obtained as shown. In the center are point scanning super SIM technologies which utilize a traditional point scanning microscope with some modifications followed by on the five plus processing. For example, in rescan microscopy, the emission is rescanned onto a very large sensitive camera chip followed by deconvolution. Uh, another example is AriScan, which uses <clears throat> a 32 detector array followed by photon reassignment calculations to approximate the point spread function center. And yet another strategy used by a few companies is uh, reducing the pinhole size and oversampling followed by real-time convolution. <clears throat> and then finally on the right, there's surf microscopy. Oops, sorry, I went too far. Um, <clears throat> also known as, sorry, let me scroll down here. It's super rate resolution radial fluctuation, fluctuation microscopy. And in this method, each pixel is magnified into subpixels, and each subpixel is then assigned a value related to the probability that it contains a fluorophore. And this probability is determined by the local radial symmetry in the image, which arises from the intrinsic radial symmetry of the microscope point spread function. So you can see it's already getting very confusing. All of these different microscopy strategies are super. So how do you choose what technology to dive into? There are many good reviews on the topic. And for example, I'd like to quickly highlight a 2019 Nature Cell Biology paper titled Super Resolution Microscopy Demystified, which very nicely outlines the strengths and weaknesses of the different modalities. However, it's always incredibly helpful to get tips and advice from expert microscopists that are actually utilizing these technologies. And so with that, I would like to begin our first topic of discussion. And so we will start with, and I'll ask our guest panelists. Oh, our guest panelists did not introduce themselves. We should have done that first. So let's have them uh, introduce themselves first. We'll start with, I'm going in order as I see you on my screen, Kevin Conway. Thanks, Kat. Uh, yeah, so I'm a research associate at uh, AOMF here at UHN. Um, and I look after the Kremble site where we have an ARI scan, uh, two photon and some other microscopes. And I contribute to some use of the STED at the P Princess Margaret site. Uh, and by the good graces of my uh, boss, I also have a small sales and consulting organization, Deep Six Imaging on the side. So I have a commercial interest as well. Thanks. Sorry, Paul, you're up next. Yeah, sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, yeah, my name is Paul Perutis. So I'm uh, like Kevin based in Toronto at the Hospital for Sick Children. 
Uh, our facility has been, this is the 22nd year that we're in operation. It's myself and Kimberly Lau that manage it together. Uh, we've got about 140 PIs and about 500 users that access our facility each year. Uh, we have a variety of equipment, but on the super resolution front, um, we have the uh, the Airy scan and, and Leica lightning systems. We have uh, the Leica Stead 3X, which has been very nice, uh, as well as the, the Zeiss Elyra PS1 for both Sim and Storm. So I look forward to a good discussion today. Thank you, Paul and Thomas. Yes, hello. First of all, thank you guys for having me here. And uh, yes, I'm Thomas Stro. I'm the director of the uh, microscopic cellular imaging facility at the Montreal Neurological Institute of McGill University. Um, and yeah, we're also a fairly big facility. We've got a wide variety of microscopes, uh, biggest chunk confocals, of course, but in terms of the super resolution, we have an Iberia um, expert line STED microscope as well as a Ruka Vutera single molecule localization microscope. And academically, I'm associated with the departments of neurology and neurosurgery and anatomy and cell biology. Research-wise, I'm interested in uh, the central regulation, uh, like brain regulation of growth hormone secretion and in the intracellular trafficking of G-protein coupled receptors. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Great, thank you. So Des, if you don't mind, I'll start off with the first question and I'll let you uh, lead up the next one. So the first uh, discussion we'd like to have there, what are some common misconceptions that users have when they're starting out with SRM? Since I have the mic open, want me to start? Uh, like I, I would say the most common misconception is that people think uh, the level of complexity and the duration of getting good super resolution images out of a sample is about the same as for confocal microscopy. So you frequently, I see Paul nodding. So uh, you got frequently people coming up to you say, oh, get that sample here. And I need uh, like a case that I remember is I need some quick images at 20 nanometer resolution. Can you help me? And then you have to explain first that uh, there's nothing quick about these techniques if you want to do it right. So that would be, I think that's really the most common misconception as far as I can see it. My colleague introduced this term to me called get there-itis. Yes, but with that, it's, it's very common. There's probably a whole other conversation we could have on the um, instant gratification uh, nature of people today, right? When it comes yes, to yes. get there-itis. Uh, yeah, I agree with Thomas. And also, uh, one thing that's important for people to understand is that um, there's a lot of numbers that are thrown out by companies. Every super resolution technique is advertised at a certain uh, performance, and that is uh, can be very misleading. People will come in and say, I want to get this image at 20 nanometers, and it depends on your sample, it depends on so many things, not to mention just the marketing that's put into these numbers. Yes. Left often, it creates unrealistic expectations for users. Yeah, I would say it's easier to get that advertised resolution with fluorescent beads than it is to do it with an actual biological sample. Yeah. So be real that, I guess. Yeah, I think one of the more common misconceptions is that they can just bring their sample that they've prepared uh, using some standard protocol that they're using for some other method and assuming that it applies to, to what they want to do. So like Thomas said, you know, this doesn't just happen very quickly. Um, it takes time to optimize the sample and they may not have optimized the sample prep even when they were doing diffraction limited imaging. Uh, so uh, the assumption that the same rules apply um, is really something they have to question going into it. That is something I'm trying act very actively to instill in at least the, the, the group of PIs in our institute that uh, do cell biology. I mean, at the MNI, we've got everything all the way from brain scanning all the way down to people relying heavily on electron microscopy. So the, the guys who do cell biology, I'll try to instill that before they embark a student on a project that uh, includes any type of high resolution microscopy, even confocal, like high level confocal, to come see me or my coworker Liliana and actually discuss the sample prep that's needed to 
just to save some time because yeah that's that's another common phenomenon people uh coming with i don't know um fluorophores that definitely will not blink under the conditions that you have on a single molecule localization microscope and would like to do that and that's uh, that happens yes and some samples just may you may not be able to image them with yeah. that, with super resolution maybe the the signal to noise is just too poor maybe the dynamics of what you're looking at just don't match up with the techniques needed to get the resolution that yeah. you want so sometimes the answer is just no also Paul, is there, is there a common sample that most people or a lot of people would come in and say, can we do this? And you just got to say, no, this is not possible. Uh, I, I find that to be more so the case with uh, tissue samples. There's the, users will come in with uh, thick slices of brain tissue or tissue that just very heavily scattering tissue. And, and that's a challenge. To, it, it, it can be overcome in some cases, but uh, it's not always easy. It's not always possible. I would agree to that. I must say, personally, in my own use of super resolution microscopy in my lab, we've got the most about well, has to do with my research interests. On the other hand, also, um, we've got very nice success with tissue samples, but you have to put in time and you have to know how to do it. Definitely, you have to clear the sample. There's nothing going without tissue clearing. Otherwise, the scattering is way too heavy, and and yeah, and all kinds of other factors that would lead to far here give a seminar on sample prep in this, but yeah, that, that is a big issue. So that, that would be uh, thick samples are, or I know that many companies and also colleagues advertise live cells, uh, super resolution microscopy, and that's not impossible, but it's very difficult. And there are techniques that lend themselves more to this than others so because of the time factor. And also, uh, in general, it all depends on how dynamic the sample is. I would say if, if you look at something very dynamic, like what I'm interested in, internalization of a G-protein coupled receptor after you stimulate with, with an agonist, I don't really think you can capture that in super resolution microscopy. It goes way too fast. Like in a minute, you wouldn't really get that. If you have slower processes, yes, why not? So I, I'm going to follow up on that just because I'm seeing some questions come in as well. So. I come from a small particle world where we're looking at viruses and exosomes or extracellular vesicles. Is this something that you could capture with super resolution in terms of say EVs? Cause there's a lot of uh, talk right now of EVs being used as therapeutics. Could you capture the uptake of a, say a dye labeled EV into a cell? So you're question going being, uh, no, sorry, I'll let you go first. Yeah. Just a question, you're going from fluid phase into compartmentalized fluorophore? Yeah. <laughs> I like how you all took a big deep breath before you, <laughs> before you answered that. Well, that's not easy in a light microscope no. to start with, right? No, no, I would ask another question then. So what do you really want to see in that? Do you want to see uptake and is a proxy of uptake good enough? To, to see it, proxy meaning, uh, do you really want to see the molecule being taken up or do you, are you happy if you see the uh, endocytic organelles forming? Well, I, I'll, I'll answer it this way. I'd be happy with the endocytic uptake. The answer is yes. But I would argue that a lot of people would want to see the dynamics of the, of the uptake. Uh, so to show you that, I picked the wrong slide, though. But no, that's uh, fine. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. You, you, you can challenge a cell. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a somatostatin person. It's a neuropeptide. So I'm a somatostatin receptor person, I should say. So you can challenge a cell with a somatostatinergic agonist, and then uh, do time. Well, live cell time lapse on the stat. I actually haven't tried. We, we really fix them in very short intervals, and you can actually see the forming clathrin coated pits, uh, early endosomes, you actually see them fuse with, uh, with uh, tubular early endosomes. You can actually catch that, yes. But I guess it's, this would be a very dedicated procedure with a lot of optimization. Oh yeah, 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 you need a student that makes that their project. Yeah, This is okay. something that uh, we did a lot of back in the day with spinning disc confocal microscopy. And, and I think uh, what I found was the biggest challenge was, was the temporal resolution that you need to visualize organellar fission infusion and things like that. And I think that's where something like a, like a lattice light sheet microscope would excel at. Yes. Um, I don't think, uh, again, not knowing the full scope of things, I don't think super resolution is, is, is necessary depending on what you're looking at. If you're looking for uptake and then 
where do things go in the cell? What are the, the what's the behavior? Uh, a good confocal system, or even better, a lattice light sheet microscope is, is ideal for, for something like that. that. That was the second, thank you for that, Paul. That was the second aspect that I wanted to mention. If, depending on the size of these organelles that you're looking at, most likely you're not, well, you can use a set microscope just simply to get a bit of a cleaner, uh, appearance of the images or to work at 100 nanometers. But you, you, if you use a super resolution microscope for that, you don't even need to push it, really not, because the organelles are big enough to see otherwise. And then that, and maybe Kevin can also, uh, everybody else can comment on that. That would be always my first question when people come up and want to do super resolution microscopy, finding out whether for, to answer their biological question, they actually really need that. Yeah. Same thing for electron microscopy, because I mean, with some of these techniques, not so much with STAT, but with others, you go through a lot of pain in the sample preparation and in running the experiment. And, and you should always ask yourself, do you actually need to do that? Or can you see it with an easier technique? Right. Yeah, I usually ask the question, what's the super resolution target of interest? And often they say, I just want to see it on the other side of the membrane. You just want to see the things internalized. That doesn't necessarily require super resolution. That requires detection, not resolution, yeah. right? So there's yeah. a, you can detect things even though you can't resolve them. Yeah. Uh, so if you want to um, watch something trafficking to the Golgi, watch uh, the formation of endosomes, uh, look at the machinery that's involved in that, then you may need some super resolution microscopy. And there may be trade-offs in that. You may be able, you may have to trade off time resolution with spatial resolution. Yes. Or like Thomas said, you can just dial in a little bit of stead, have a little bit of improvement and not kill your sample, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not gonna work if it's dead, right? True. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this question up with a quick summary. So. Some of the misconceptions are that it really takes a lot of planning and optimization. Um, achieving the company um, uh, stated resolutions can be an unrealistic uh, expectation. Oftentimes people don't really need super resolution for their biological question. Um, and you probably will have to do some research onto different reagents for fluorophores or mounting medias um, and reactive oxygen like species scavengers. So all these kinds of things are sort of, should be considered before going on. May um, I add one sentence to that? I, I would actually say it's easy. I said it's easier with beads, but you can in almost on most cases that I personally uh, went through, you can actually push the microscopes to give you the advertised resolution in your samples if you get the sample prep right. The, 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 the catch is you need a student who makes this the centerpiece of their work for one or two years. Right. Thank that's, you. That's, that's, that's the downside brain. to it because it's not easy. You need to put in the time. Very good point. That's yeah. Um, Des, we kind of highlighted a few things, but Des, maybe you can start with the next uh, question. Yeah, and I think we've actually started to lead into this. Let's talk a little bit about matching the, the super resolution uh, modality or application to the actual need of the PI. Um, mm -hmm. And if you guys can just highlight uh, resolution basically on 2D and 3D imaging of thicker specimens and also multicolor imaging and live cell imaging, broad topic. Maybe we can tack it, tackle it one at a time. Like, yeah, let's let's go. Let's, what would you guys say is the, the easiest example of an application that a PI may come to you for for SRM? Who wants to start? And maybe since I'm also a PI, <laughs> I'll start with myself because I'll show an image from that study also because I, in or with with one of my master students, uh, the last two years. We had a question that really asked for super resolution and very high resolution. Essentially, we want to see um, synapses, actual synapses forming and unforming in the hypothalamus of the mouse in different phases of the growth hormone secretion cycle. And we def will define synapse by proximity of clusters of pre and post synaptic uh, localization of uh, typical marker proteins for pre and post synapse, right? So right there, this, essentially in the old days, that was a question for an electron microscope. Now you can do it with a light microscope. But that, I would say, is a question. When image, 
synapses, yes, super resolution is uh, required and appropriate, I would say. Can you say synapse, I mean the actual synapse, like the active zone, right? Can you comment, Thomas, on what uh, kind of SRM your students um, Because we that? wanted to be very quantitative, we did that with single molecule localization. Yeah, I find that's often the place to start is uh, to um, kind of divide and conquer, right? So it, to figure out if, if somebody is looking at architecture where you're looking at um, where single molecule localization, it, there's no other way to do it. Yep. That takes care of it. And if they don't need that, then you get into this realm of STED and SIM and ARI scan, which kind of blend together. And I, I feel that it's dictated more so by the sample uh, than the technique, although it's, it's a very, very fluid uh, thing. I mean, the other aspect, if I don't know whether that comes up in one of the other questions still, but if you look at what Katarina introduced us to as super resolution techniques, I would say the three classic ones, which would then be STED, single molecule localization and, and classical SIM, in terms, of, in terms of sample preparation or ease of sample preparation or uh, the, the, the similarity of it to making a confocal sample and also ease of use of the microscope, the most approachable technique for most people will be a STET microscope from that aspect. Of course, financially, the most approachable one will most likely be a SIM microscope, but technically I think that will be the most one and that can go far, a long way. Like the 50 nanometer thing is, achievable with a stat. I, don't, I wouldn't say that it still takes a long time of, of, of uh, optimization and so on. So if people want to see more than they can see in a confocal microscope, I would try to steer them to stat if they don't have a real molecular question, like where they want to see molecule uh, or a receptor cluster. It's interesting, Thomas. I, uh, as you were explaining your thought process. I actually thought you might've said SIM and the rationale was uh, at least in our facility, we have had great success with STED, um, but I find that, uh, and, and our STED system is a three color system, mm -hmm. uh, but there's a, a certain complexity to getting the right fluorophores in place. That's right. Um, and, and even to get that resolution dialed in, um, Whereas with SIM, uh, it uses all conventional fluorophores, right? All four wavelengths, uh, they're all compatible. And as long as your sample is nice, is well labeled, you, you can get pretty good images. I, it, in our hands, I, I found that to be the easiest route. Okay. Although my preference is for STED and I think it has the best potential. I like the fact that it, it piggybacks onto a confocal so the transition's easier, yeah. but uh, it, I don't disagree. Uh, I, I just, uh, I find that SIM has some ad advantages just in, in the ease of sample prep and fluorophores and so forth. And I largely agree with you. Just, just to, to finish up my, my thought process is of course heavily biased by the fact that we don't have a SIM, but we have a step microscope. And, and one of the aspects is that as you put it, it piggybacks on a confocal. So the transition is easy for people who are already experienced confocal microscopists easier. But what's true, of course, is it involves a lot of trying around with the fluorophores and how they interact with your depletion lasers. That, that's the factor that costs the users time. You cannot just simply go with a dye combination and expect it to perform at its best. There's too much photochemistry involved to, to get that. And that is not the case on a SIM microscope. That's true. Yeah, I think the fact that with a because the stead piggybacks on a confocal modality, I th I think I tend to find uh, the easiest uptake uh, to switch over to stead. So we don't have a sim in the facility at this point. I have used them in the past. Um, it's easiest to determine if they've already reached the limit of diffraction with confocal imaging. So you can ask them this question if they've reached the limit by asking them what their pixel size is. Are they still imaging 512 by 512 at a zoom of one? Uh, are they under sampling in Z? You can figure this out by looking very quickly and you can get a lot of information out of the image just by sampling at Nyquist and even doing deconvolution on it. So I find that 
road easiest to traverse if they're already doing confocal. Um, I agree from the sample prep perspective, SIM is probably an easier, easier flip. Um, but on the modality side, yeah, I think it's an easier path to traverse uh, to stead. So there's sort of like two parts to this. Um, how easy it, is it from your sample or how easy it from operating the system? Yes. Um, uh, maybe all three of you can comment on this, but uh, at least for stead, you need specialized floor fours. It would be great to get some expert advice as to which you've had the most success with on your stead microscopes. To Heavily depends on which, I, well, if I start again, sorry, but in, anyway, um, it depends on which uh, depletion lasers you have. But in general, there are some of the Alexa fluors, surprisingly, that work very well. And for, for, for instance, Alexa 594, if you have an orange depletion laser, or even a red depletion laser, it will work with both. That works well. Uh, and then into, we get into the specialized or more or less uh, common fluorophores, both ATO dyes and star dyes, I would say, perform excellently. I mean, it's really, they are also more, much more expensive than standard. The, the secondary antibodies are much more expensive than your standard secondaries that you would use, couple to cyanine dyes or lexofluors, but they're worth their while if you want to do STET because they actually work well with uh, these microscopes. That's what I would say. Just out of curiosity, what, what kind of price differential you're talking about? Um, as, because I've done so much demoing for a barrier so far, I've never bought any of the stuff, a couple of secondary antibodies, but you have to dilute these things one in a hundred. So even if they come at the same price as an aliquot of an Alexa fluor, you're paying five times as much right there and then, but they're more expensive than Alexa fluor. So they are indeed very expensive secondary antibodies, but if you want to do stead, uh, they're worth their money. So at least five times more based on dilution. To give an example, I tried, and it actually stead all, even works with uh, Psi 5 and Alexa 647. The problem is, as soon as you switch on your depletion laser, you need an extremely strong signal because you can watch it go down like, like this, you know, so. And with these more specialized dyes that were developed with stead in mind, that won't happen. They're very stable. Yeah, I can second that. Uh, the star dyes really are excellent, but we have had good success with even Alexa 48 and, and some of those dyes, they have worked well. Yeah. Uh, the bigger challenge, with, and, and I don't have uh, a ton of experience with live stead imaging, um, it, in our hands, GFP has categorically not worked, but we have had success with YFP. So we have had, we, we have done um, live cell time-lapse imaging with uh, reasonable frame rates and a reasonable period of time. So I, I want to say, um, and it was 2D imaging. So uh, we were taking an image maybe every 10 seconds for two minutes, something like that, which three minutes, I can't remember exactly, but reasonable. And at a resolution, I don't remember offhand, but probably in the, in the low hundreds, maybe 100, 110, somewhere in there. Um, so yeah, I, I, I echo Thomas's words about the star dyes and on the, on the live cell part in terms of fluorophores, we have only used YFP so far. Yeah, we haven't had a lot of uptake on the STED um, so far, uh, but what we do typically use for QC and for training is are the, um, uh, the barrier uh, sample slides. Uh, so they've got a very nice single label and triple labeled cell sample, as well as some, uh, some small, um, small beads as well. Um, so the star dyes do tend to work, you know, optimally with those. Without having done this um, myself, so take it with a grain of salt, but I've heard from people um, who, who try it, who did it, that uh, silent isorotamine uh, coupled um, reagents work in live cell applications hmm. quite well. Can you repeat that, Thomas? But that's silenized rhodamine. It's a, it's a, I didn't really, because I'm not doing in my own research a lot, and nobody actually asked me here in my facility yet to do any live cells that I haven't really researched into it. But I do know that you can get good information on it from the educational side of Leica, for instance. So there's, there's some reagents out there that seem to work well with live cell stat. But it's more in the orange range. Uh, GFP, I agree. GFP, yeah. Yeah, it's not very surprising. It's not that 
doesn't have that high quantum yield and it's not very photostable. So if you start, um, actually what's bleaching on a stat microscope is actually the fact that you're looking at that small area after depletion and you have to excite much more than in a normal confocal in order to get enough photons, right? And that will bleach your GFP there. The GFP is difficult, I agree with that. Just looking at fixed samples with GFP, it bleaches very fast. Okay. Do we want to comment uh, on sort of the 3D imaging? Because I would imagine that's that's something that a lot of people are going to want to do because it's, you know, for lack of a better word, it's something sexy. You're going to get great pictures. Mm. But what are some of the realities of, of trying to do that with SRM? Thomas, we'll let you take you the lead. Me, okay. Um, there are, again, it, it starts with sample prep. Uh, again, for instance, uh, what's recommended and, and actually really needed um, to get, to not interfere with the depletion laser is using specialized, um, or not specialized, but only some mounting media will not interfere with the depletion laser. For, for instance, the prolong products, prolong gold, prolong diamond, and so on. Trouble is they cure if you don't isolate them from the air. And if you want to do 3D, what that will do is it'll flatten your sound, like to your, you're introducing an artifact right there. So you have to know that if you want to do that, um, you actually have to seal your cover glasses with uh, nail polish uh, before it has a chance to cure. Otherwise, you're flattening your sample. So it starts right there. Um, 3D is, but well, it depends on the thickness of the sample if, uh, to, to escape into an easy answer. If you have a thin sample, like a mono layer of flat cells, you have no issues. If you have anything thicker than that, you have to clear the sample because at, with any depth, uh, the diffraction will, even on a step microscope, the, the modulation of the depletion laser will not go many microns into a sample, it'll, it'll go away. So you lose the resolution. You can still image the sample, but it'll become more like confocal. And of course, if you do single molecule localization, diffraction kills you. That's <laughs> yes, that was a that was actually a question that I had received from uh, from Vera. If you could talk about single molecule detection on a virus or based on fluorophore, if you could actually say you know one antibody, one fluorophore. You yeah oh, um, in principle yes. If you want to do that, if you want to do it quantitative at that level, you want to count virus particles. I would make my own secondary antibodies and I would test them for a substitution ratio of one to one. Because what the microscope sees is fluorophores. And if you use a commercial, because they over uh, attach the, the fluorophores to get, make them brighter, right? So there's multiple fluorophore molecules on the secondary antibody. If you localize that, you get four or five localizations that are clustered rather than only one. So again, so, it comes down to- So if you use commercial antibodies, which otherwise I always recommend because you get more photons out, but if you want to do particle counting, then I would conjugate my own secondaries and make sure I get a stichiometry of one to one. Can I, um, am I allowed to share a picture at this point? <laughs> uh, just Desmond, on your question there, yeah. I just pulled up, um, we had somebody do that very thing, not, not with viruses, but they were interested in counting molecules. And so this was, uh, the image that I just pulled up. So these are uh, mouse macrophages. On the left is a confocal stead image. On the right is, is the stead only. These are, there's no processing whatsoever. The resolution on the right measured is around uh, 80 nanometers. On the left, I think, whatever it was, 220, 240. But the point here is that um, each of these, so the antibody that was used was a single monoclonal fab fragment. Uh, and then through stepwise photo bleaching, it was determined that there were 1.1, on average, 1.1 fluorophores per fab. That's awesome. So that, that means yeah. that when we're looking at these dots, we can, with fairly good confidence, say that they are individual molecules. Yeah. Uh, but it, it comes down to the labeling strategy yeah. rather than the technique. Yeah. But that you have to, if you want to do such a thing, that's a kind of approach that you have to do that, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I would ask, you know, this is not something that someone's going to walk into your lab and do in a day. No. no. So, yeah, so can you, uh, Paul, if you want to comment, like what kind of time frame are we looking at to do that type of experiment? Is this is a week, a month? Yeah, so, my aunt, yeah, the, um, 
I, I can't comment exactly on, on how long it took for this user to generate the images, but we did work together for a period of time. And most of the, most of the, the, the work was in actually in producing the antibodies in, in doing the purification in doing the stepwise photo bleaching to have confidence to make that claim. Uh, I was actually quite surprised. These images came about pretty easily, but the time was in the sample prep. And I, I would say probably around two months, okay. two to three months. And this is in a lab that does a lot well, of imaging. Well, so. that, that goes, uh, thank you for saying that. That goes for all of these techniques. Yeah. So, so it's, it's not so much the time, although I think single molecule uh, localization that can be bitchy too, and then so uh, that can also take a long time until you get the actual imaging right, but uh, or will most likely. But in general, more of the time goes into the sample. But you need perfect samples. Does such a thing exist? Yeah, there's not such a thing, but you need to <laughs> you need to get as perfect as you can because, in particular, if you push the resolution, it's like an EM. Now then, you're actually going to see it. If you permeabilize your sample and you go to an EM, you're going to see the holes in the membranes, right? So exactly. <laughs> so, Katarina, I just want to reach out. We're we're getting low on time. Yeah, I don't want to um, take much time out of the end where you guys will highlight some of your most successful SRM applications. So. Um, and it sounds like basically the last question was from a facility perspective, what's the most adoptable super resolution? And I think we answered that already. I think so, yeah. yeah. I would like to do like a quick vote. So, so like, for example, the best SRM technique for live cell imaging is, I will let you go first. <laughs> Sorry, who? Me? The, the, like, I, I, I thought... Like for live cell imaging, it sounds like a lot of them are actually not very good for live cell imaging and probably a light sheet would be better. Um, uh, but but maybe the conventional SIMS or STED would be the best for live cell imaging. Does everyone sort of agree on that? Yeah, my vote's for SIM actually. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, of the light levels, I would say the same. All right, uh, for multi imaging, Multicolor? Yes. yes. Let's say multiplexing is your most important thing and you need to look at three or four things at once. They can all do that. De okay. depends, on, depends on the lasers that you have. But again, because of the, the ease of sample, again, probably SIM yeah. most likely. If you have what do you a, think, Kevin? Yeah, I think with STED it gets harder because uh, the 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 yeah. combinations that work with a set of bleaching or la stud lasers, uh, it gets a bit restrictive when you get to four. I think two is doable, three is hard, four is really hard. I, I think four is easiest with SIM. I think Storm is uh, Storm or GSD is good for two or three or even four if you put the work in. So I think it also depends, as you guys were mentioning on your sample. So what do you want to give up? You can't. Depends on what you do, though, with yeah. Storm. I know somebody who does the, uh, DNA paint, and they are multi. I, I don't even know what Sarah is doing right now. Very many. Uh, it, that actually works, mm -hmm. but again, you have to be dedicated to this if you do that. If you want to be right. successful. Yeah. Not in a core facility. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're muted, Katerina. You're still muted, Katerina. All right, I think we're going to get on to the rapid fire <laughs> round. Let me just share my screen because I have our panelists uh, some of the stuff they wanted to highlight here. Uh, is that visible, everyone? Yes. Okay, so Thomas, you're okay. Up. Yeah, that, that's from me. So what I want to highlight here is the left panel. You see confocal image of mouse hypothalamus on the right side. You see a similar area that. Our uh, storm microscope is not on a confocal, so it's an equivalent or a comparable area, and that is storm. So you can see, you can actually, green would be labeling for a protein of uh, synaptic vesicles, so the presynapse and the red area is the postsynaptic density. We're imaging um, a receptor molecule there. And uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, where we look at the, um, at the uh, most successful application. Here we imaged again, what's looking magenta is the presynaptic clusters of, of, of a synaptic vesicle protein postsynapse. We're imaging a structural protein of the postsynaptic density and 
to the raw storm image of this. This is all cells that we identified with a third label that you don't see here in the SLM. It's just a counter stain for a hormone. So we know that this is the right type of cells, growth releasing hormone. Then we used an, a cluster analysis approach to actually identify what, what's really synapses in there. Because what you see here in A is, what you're getting is really a bunch of dots. You see some that appear to be clustered together, but what is to tell you now that they really belong together? So we identified in all of these localizations, the, the first peak in uh, abundance or density of, uh, of um, detections based on their distance from one another. We fed that into a density-based spatial clustering of applications algorithm, dbscan, which is a very common at the moment in the field uh, algorithm for doing cluster analysis on set, that type of data. And that pulls us out what it thinks are actually clusters that are related to, to one another based on that minimum distance that we identified there. And then you can select your clusters as being associated to the cell and can do a quantitative analysis here. For instance, we look at how far are these clusters uh, away from each other It's their minimum distance. That was our criterion here to say, we're looking at actual synapses and not at clusters that are not related to one another based on what's known from the literature on the, on the width, width of, the, of the synaptic cleft, but plus how far the cluster of the synaptic vesicles that would appear in magenta in this uh, um, F uh, panel there. And that was a very nice paper because we were able to correlate this to the actual underlying endocrinology to the cycle of growth hormone, actually growth hormone concentrations in the blood of these animals at the time they were sacrificed. Thomas, is this a single slice or? Um... This is a single section that is 30 microns thick uh, it's cleared uh, and we cleared with, um, um, uh, um, not, not with um, clarity, but with um, scale buffer. And we're imaging about 10 microns into the tissue. Great. These look awesome. I'm gonna move to the next slide, which is Kevin, you're up next, most successful. Oh, that's awesome. Great. So um, often when we do this in the facility, uh, we give people a, a, a walkthrough of, you know, what brings them to a super resolution scope. So they need to have some sort of biological target of interest. So um, in, to put these together, I, I just pulled out the, the Iberia sample slide. Um, it's a stain of a nuclear pore complex, um, which in the cartoon here you can see is about 20 nanometers uh, on the side of the donut. Uh, so the whole structure is, is you know, below the limit of uh, diffraction. So this would be kind of an ideal uh, structure that you may want to image um, uh, in the microscope. Sorry, next slide. Great. So uh, I got the best possible confocal image I could get on the SP8, uh, sampled an Nyquist, and then did the deconvolution. So that helped a bit, but it's clear that we're still, you know, hovering around or below the, the diffraction limit. You can go. Yeah, there we go. So on the bottom, we've got the, the, the best, you know, the Nyquist sample, deconvolved sample on the bottom. Um, dialing in the stead laser, so we used a 775. This was, um, yeah. it was star red. Um, cleaned up remarkably with stead. Uh, the deconvolution really helps the stead image a lot. Uh, so it helps to deal with the noise because when you're doing stead, you you have very few photons. Uh, the stead laser, laser gets rid of most of the photons and these aren't gated. I didn't gate it either, but when you do, you lose even more photons. The other thing that comes up instead is uh, if you take a long, slow Z stock, uh, this is a max projected Z stock. Uh, drift can become an issue, and you can see that if you do point spreads. Uh, I don't show that here, but if you do point spreads uh, with a stead um, in stead mode, you can see that it's it, it may drift a little bit on the side. Okay, next uh, next slide. I just did them bang bang bang. So I zoomed this up really tightly so that you can see that in fact it does make a profound difference. So. Uh, quick and dirty, full with half max, I was able to get around 68. I'm sure if I hunted around, I could probably get better, but this was uh, literally, you know, 30 to 40 minutes of work on a stead. Like Paul said, it's not, the, the doing the stead isn't the hard part of it. It's the hard part is the sample prep. And the nice thing about commercial samples is you can walk people through on a training or or give them an idea of what they can expect and uh, and, and not have these other questions about the the, the 
the sample prep itself. Okay, and then Paul, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that you can sure. do your rapid fire round for just a quick question, Kevin, when you decon those images, uh, are you using, what are you using? Uh, so we have uh, Huygens in the facility. Um, you, you should get similar results, but that was with Huygens with the classic NLE. Yeah. Yep. Great. So um, this image that I'll share here, hopefully you can see it. So this is from one of our users. Uh, I don't remember exactly the cell type, but they're looking at CD44. So this is a, a surface mark, surface protein that's involved in cell adhesion, migration, lymphocyte activation, and so forth. Uh, again, I don't remember the cell type. Clearly here, uh, you can tell that we're focused on the apical, on the, the, uh, apical layer. Uh, but what's cool about, and, and the label here is Alexa 488. Uh, what I thought was cool, and this was early on, uh, we had our stead microscope is new. Uh, in green is the confocal image and in red is the stead image. And what I thought was awesome is just as you zoom in, you can just see beautifully how uh, the stead is picking up all these individual uh, puncta that by confocal just look like a series of continuous uh, streaks of fluorescence. Yeah. And I thought at the time, again, this was when our stead microscope was fairly new. I thought this was incredible. It was like, uh, you know, lifting uh, the veil, so to speak, and um, just a nice demonstration of what it means to have super resolution. So that's uh, my two cents. Is that with the three X dialed in, the 3D? Uh, that was uh, only 2D. We did not do a 3D section on that, yeah. Right. So it was with gating uh, and uh, with Alexa 40, we can typically push the 592 depletion pretty high. I don't remember what it was at, but we would have used a high depletion laser and a, a pretty good amount of gating. That's awesome. Thank yeah, those you, are... Thomas, Paul, and Kevin. Amazing um, examples. And thank you for all your tips and advice. Um, I'm a little bit of a... Uh, kind of a being a bit tricky because I actually don't have a super resolution system in my facility. So this is also um, self-serving for me. I get to learn a little bit more when I'm moving forward on, as to what we may or may not uh, want to adopt in our, our facility here at uh, the Keenan Research Center. So uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you to Kevin, Paul, and Thomas for their expert advice. Thank you to Desmond for co-moderating. And thank you, Sachiko Seto, for introducing your facility. Good. Um, and um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Stay safe, everyone.